Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, Horrifically Horrifying, uh, brought to you by HCA, Hollywood Critics Association. Uh, I am one of your hosts, Kevin Taft, and I am here with my cohort in crime, Heather Wixon. Hello. And we have a special guest here with us today, and that would be Jacob Johnston, who um, has a movie coming out called Dreamcatcher in a few weeks. And he's here today to, uh, we're going to pick his brain actually about it about his film and talk about other horror stuff. So welcome, Jacob. Thank you, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, it's amazing. Perfect. So, you know, one of the things we like to do talk about on the show is like what we're watching, horror related, obviously. Sure. Um, so have you seen anything lately that you like, didn't like? Um, I saw Psycho Gorman uh, recently and, and uh, so fun. Wow, like I just, I don't know if I went in with with certain expect, I just, I, it just changed. I don't know, like I, I watched it and I was like, this is great. Like, I just had a fun time from beginning to end. Are you all about the hunky boys now? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I was, I was really excited about that one. I don't know if you would call it horror, but Promising Young Woman. Yes. Uh, so good. Fantastic. Just like, I, I don't, there, I don't even have the right words, but the, the, the uh, prowess of that film is is incredible the performances this this the writing everything uh big fan big fan watched it twice oh wow yeah nice. <laughs> I, I love that movie too i have the soundtrack i work out to it <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah the soundtrack it's marrying you know i think it's it is to marry to the film in in like an organic way mm -hmm. um and in genre fair it can be tough because I feel like we're so programmed to like, oh, it needs to be this kind of music. And so subverting those expectations, I think is, is, is a really exciting thing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. What, what about you guys? What, what are you excited about? You know, it's funny is you, I just watched a movie. I don't know if you've watched it yet, um, Heather, uh, Lucky. Oh yeah, from Natasha Kermani. Yeah. Who did I, Imitation Girl a few years ago. Yes, I watched that last night. I wasn't, I mean, I really liked it. I wasn't quite sure. I had to think about it afterwards, but it, it would be a good companion to Promising a Woman. Absolutely. I'm, I'm so excited for that one. That one's the Shudder uh, yeah. in, in like a couple weeks, I think. A couple weeks. Um, really excited about that one. Yeah, that was, uh, it was better than I thought it was gonna be. I wasn't quite sure what to expect, actually. I was like, I don't know what this is, but I like that. <laughs> yeah, Bria Grant's kind of like sort of taken over horror in the last year. She certainly year. has. I mean, not that she hasn't been consistent for years, but between, you know, acting and directing, um, you know, between like After Midnight, Lucky, and then she did 12 Hour Shift with Angela Bettis. Like she is having a heck of a run. I think she's doing another one. I just got a thing on it. The hairstylist or the stylist? Stylist. Oh, the stylist. The stylist. Yeah, she's uh, she has a part in that as well. Yeah. So. Did you did you guys see um, uh, She Dies Tomorrow? I know this was kind of yes. a festival. I, I recently I saw that. That was like maybe a couple weeks ago. Um, what'd you guys think about that one? It was heavy because I saw it like right as we were like a few months into lockdown. Yeah. So it was one of those. Yeah. And I was just like, I kind of sat there in sort of a stunned silence afterwards. <laughs> and I was like, do I want to be made into leather? I don't know. Like what, what yeah. happens? Um, but I actually really liked it. I was uh, really surprised by it. Again, it was one of those, I didn't have any sort of idea of what I was in for. Um, but I really like Amy Simons as a director. Uh, she does some really interesting things. Are you, getting, are you getting house jacked over there? I, there was a big dog attack. I live on Beachwood Canyon. And so there's like constant dog skirmishes outside. And if it's not dog skirmishes, it's like fire trucks or helicopters. I guess people try to climb the Hollywood sign. So you just constantly, there's like a helicopter <laughs> circling this oh neighborhood God. at all times. Um, but but I will, I hope that it is quelled for, for this conversation. Um, <laughs> Sounds fine. Would be nice. <laughs> yes, I have two dogs who somehow when I do these, they're really quiet. And the minute I stop, they jump up and they're like, okay, we know you're not working anymore. Like, let's, <laughs> let's do things. So they're actually That's pretty polite. good. Yeah, so, I like that. Yeah, well trained. And, and so yep. the one barks right now. So thank you, Utah. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, so let, let's uh, talk about other horror movies we've seen recently, which would be Dreamcatcher. So Jacob, let's talk about your movie. Let's do it. Um, yes. So, I mean, kind of an obvious question, but, you know, A, why did, I mean, I, I know, because we know each other, so I know you like horror. Um, so that's not a shock that you would want to do horror, but why, like, the slasher genre? Um, what was kind of the impetus? What was, where did the story come from? Sure. It, uh, it was kind of a, a, 
situation where I feel like doesn't happen very often in this town, which was that I had known the producers for, for many years and we both shared a love for, uh, for genre fair, like the 90s genre fair, especially and these very ensemble character driven pieces. And um, I got a call out of the blue, like I think we've known each other for like six years, but they called me and, and they were like, hey, we have financing. Um, we don't have a script and we have shoot dates and we'd love to work with you. And because we, we, we have like a shared taste and in terms of like things that we love. Um, and uh, it, it, they, they were like, we want to do an ensemble. We, we'd love for it to deal somewhat with music in some capacity, you know, like to, to what degree that is, you can decide. Um, and, and so I, I kind of took it and I took a couple weeks to like think about it. And uh, it, it's, I think when you live in, in this world of like kind of a slasher adjacent, I'm gonna call it that because I don't know if I'd classify it strictly as a slasher. Um, and it was like so much of the first step is like the practicality of your killer. What is the mythos? What is the design? What is the iconography? And I think that that can inform so much of what the story ends up being. And, and I didn't wanna spend so much time trying to establish a mythology in, in, in lieu of character development. So it was like, what can I do that's like modern zeitgeist, interesting, and not have to spend 30 minutes of the movie trying to establish where this, you know, the, the, the facade of the character comes from. And it was like EDM you know, Marshmallow and Dead Mouse and these characters where it's like, we go to these huge concerts, thousands of people with a person in a mask that could literally be anybody and just like rave and have the best time of our life. And I was like, what kind of great commentary is that? To have that figurehead be your killer, to, to be the, you know, this, this blind, almost like deity that we're praising and that's gonna be your figurehead and that's gonna be our killer. And that mask is gonna represent society in so many different ways and so then once i knew that i wanted to set it in edm i was like great now i can kind of figure out who the characters are what the event is and and leaning into like the 90s story structure sensibility of like tragic accident bad thing happens now we have to kind of like you know the, the fallout of that um and that was kind of how it all came together and and knowing the end up front you know knowing that i really wanted to, to do what happens like really also informed it and it let me to um, spend so much time figuring out the trauma of these characters uh, at a baseline. All yeah. right, so so Jacob, you and I are about to become best friends. I don't Great. know if you know this, um, because every time I talk about like electronic music and EDM, nobody knows what the hell I'm talking about. So for me, I was like, okay, cool, horror with EDM, because I'm, I, admittedly when I go to shows everybody probably thinks like I'm there with my kid and my kid is off wandering somewhere <laughs> so you know because I'm like this older lady who's like in my 40s and they're just like why are you here but like I it's funny because like for as much as I love horror the one place that I feel like I can always lose myself is at like a festival um and it was funny because like I, one of the moments like in the movie you mentioned like oh edc last year and i was like well this obviously had to take place in 2020 you filmed in 2020 <laughs> because there was no edc in 2020 so i knew all these things but um nerd. yes music nerd <laughs> yes so i was really excited about this um and i love the fact that you mentioned like dead mouse and marshmallow uh and even mala to a degree because like we know who dead mouse is we know who marshmallow is now at this point mala i'm still like i don't really know what his his face looks like and stuff. And I'm curious, was there something about sort of the the music itself because it has sort of that rhythmic beat to it that like sort of made it fun to like use it as a backdrop for a horror movie because I always love movies that really sort of lean into music when they're doing things like the stalk and the kill and things like that. Absolutely. I think that that in in genre, especially like we're so trained in knowing the setups of music like where it's like, this is the setup to the scare. This is the setup to the kill. This is, and, and we as viewers know that. Um, and I think that there's so much fun to be had when you set it in a world of music, there really is a rhythm. There is a heartbeat, there's a melody. There is, it, it, it is no different than the structure of a film itself. It rises and it falls, it rises and it falls. And how we can follow that throughout the movie, you know, we have our high highs and our low lows. It's evocative of that. And so I think being able to personify, oh, it's a movie about music. Oh, but also the character development. Oh, also the kill, like everything kind of follows the same cadence, hopefully in a way that that is, you know, 
it, it is representative you know, it's representative of the actual style of music um, and I think the thing that, that's fun about EDM is is it's it's sometimes very uh, it, it is not always so um, structured sometimes it has these moments where you're just like what it just happened and I think <laughs> with, with Dreamcatcher we have some moments like that where it's like you know you're following certain rules and then you subvert them in a way and it's the way that the you know, same way that EDM music does the same thing it's like oh this beat's gonna drop at a place where I didn't think it was gonna drop or this joke is gonna happen at a place where I didn't think it would maybe be appropriate for so it's you know being able to play with dissonance uh narrative dissonance which I think is kind of fun it is really quick just to follow up that like what's a, the best show you've seen <laughs> uh um you know a few years ago uh, actually at Avalon in Hollywood. I know it's okay. it's not a big, fa but I saw Ferry Courtson and oh. it was in, in, it was Ferry Courtson and um, God, I don't remember who, it was like an up and comer who opened for him, but it was like three in the morning by the time Ferry got on. And uh, it was, it was just like rapturous. I don't know. It was like, it's, it's just <laughs> like, there's something that happens. It's the same thing with like night shoots on a set where you're just like something happens around two or 3 AM where it's just like everybody gets the second wind and they're just inspired. And you're like, I don't know what's happening, but it's great. And I'm, I'm feeling it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really, it's really fulfilling. Um, what about you? What, what's been one of your favorites? You know, it's, it's strange. Cause like, um, usually we cover escape for our sites. So like, usually we get to go to escape every Halloween and then like 2019 Halloween, we had just gotten a puppy. So I actually sent my other half to go cover the festival and I stayed home with the dog. So I was like, Oh, that's fine. There's going to be a new, you know, a new show coming up or whatever. <laughs> and you know, basically now there's been no show since. Um, so I'd have to go to the show right before that, which was res, uh, which I'm actually wearing a res shirt. Uh, I was like, I'm going to represent. So I have a little res shirt on. Um, but it was at the, oh, it's the outside venue. I'm totally blanking on it. They used to hold the Scream Awards there, but it was like, we had seats, which seats at an EDM show is really terrible. <laughs> and we were like, we were like, <laughs> screw it. Like, let's upgrade and get to the stage. And like two or three weeks before that, Dead Mouse did like his five show run uh, at, um, I'm totally blanking on like every venue okay. thing right now, <laughs> but he did like a five, a five, like a five, uh, show run. And we were, we got, actually got like right up on the stage, like right next to it for those, which was ridiculous. And then Rez came along a few weeks later. I'm like, okay, fine, let's upgrade. And we actually were like center stage front, like right there. Um, and that was super cool. Cause she's like one of my favorites. And we actually sure. got to see, um, Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on who opened. Um, but yeah, like we've seen, oh, I'm getting a note. The, the Greek is where we saw Rez and the Palladium is where we saw Dead Mouse. Sorry. <laughs> my other half's in the other room and he's like, let me help you out. That's um, great, yeah. right? And I had, wish I had that every time yeah. I blinked. <laughs> and the sadness is like we saw, I believe it was IO opened for Dead Mouse, which unfortunately now he's passed away. Yeah. So we were grateful that at least we got to see him like three times open for Dead Mouse too, so. It's but incredible that this is like listening to a foreign language. I'm like, what? I know. I'm so sorry, Kevin. <laughs> I just oh, and Kevin's here too. I forgot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And it was Peekaboo who actually opened for Res. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't so. know if I know Peekaboo as well, but. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sorry, Kevin. I'll bring it back to the movie. Um, because also. <laughs> totally music fine. Yeah, because you meant, you know, music is obviously an uh, important component. And what I thought was interesting about this, too, is I found there was a lot of parallels um, between something like Valentine, because you mentioned 90s horror, but also Phantom of the Paradise, especially with the mask design. Am I <laughs> Brand of Palma, yes. Yes, okay. I was, it was so funny. I was thinking this morning, I was like, I wonder, you know, I've, in all of these kind of conversations I've had about the movie, so many people talk about the design, and I never bring up Phantom of the Paradise. Um, but, but because I feel like it's such an obscure thing, but, but it, it was not an immediate reference. It was kind of a happy coincidence. Um, I, I, I uh, enlisted a friend of mine who I used to work with at Marvel, Josh Herman, who's an incredible designer, um, an incredible artist who, who did the characters like Groot for Guardians of the Galaxy. He's designed many of the Iron Man suits. And, uh, and I was like, I really need something. Cause when I was writing it, I honestly had no idea what I wanted it to look like because I knew I needed it to be super simple. I needed it to be modern and I needed it to be something that wasn't so egregious and scary and weird. Because it's like, when you go to these shows, if somebody comes out in this like butchered face mask, you're not gonna watch right. them 
been music because it's going to be like this is terrifying so it, it had to it had to be something that in 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 the right lighting and the right context could be kind of scary and hopefully uh iconic in a lot of different ways um and and so we started talking about you know different things and obviously the the massage finale has been used so many different times whether it's been in batman whether it's been in phantom of the paradise but i also love the idea of elongating the human face in general that, that there's this, this notion of a, a, a person, whomever it is, but also in Dylan's own point of view, the, the guy who actually is the DJ, almost like bastardizing the human form in a lot of ways. And then using the design lines to create and, and weave what would be kind of a dream catcher with the eye being the center piece of the, of, of the dream catcher. Um, Cause in, in the actual folklore of dream catchers, the center is kind of like this gateway uh to to you know the soul or to whatever and and i love this idea that that it was a gateway to nothing that it was just black like this bleak like soulless <laughs> thing um and the original idea was they would light up those lines would have a red glow that would kind of like and and in the end it it, it became too comic book to be perfectly honest like it became too it 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 was an awesome idea that I think in my head when I was like, oh, in like a black hallway, lights kick on and you just get these lines and it, it would be so iconic. And, and, and but then in the wrong lighting, it would look kind of silly or it wouldn't work. And uh, it was kind of a, a hazard anyway, because you'd have, you know, all these electrical systems inside the mask. And when you're doing stunts and stuff, like it, it became a budget issue to be perfectly honest. And, and maybe down the line in Dreamcatcher 5, <laughs> we'll have the lights kick on, but, um, but, but yeah, I, I, it's so funny that you bring that up because most people have not seen that movie. And the, the thematic elements of that movie, the love story element of that movie, I think is so representative uh, in the Dreamcatcher mythology as well. Yeah. Um, so, Plus, so you mentioned Faust as well in the movie, which as soon as I was like Faust, and then I saw the mask and I was like, oh my gosh, we're doing Fan of the, Fan of the Paradise, which ex tell Kevin he needs to see this movie because I've I was never telling seen him. It. It's, it's such a... Um, it is it is it is such a when you talk about cult movies and like just the the level of just like when you watch it you don't know if you're having the best time of your life or if it's like the weirdest thing you've ever seen but but it is it is bold and it is interesting and the music is catchy and uh I you know I was thinking I actually rewatched it about three weeks ago and I was like I don't know how you even would remake like it would be cool to see a resurgence of this but how do you how do you do it without it becoming a joke. Water, or watered down even. Or watered it's, down. It's really strange. Um, Kevin, I feel like you would absolutely love it. I'm just, I'm just putting that out there. Like, I okay. think I'm, like once we end this episode, like I think I have to give you homework and next time we meet, you're going to have to tell me what you thought what of, I thought of that? paradise. Yes. Well, and, and Kevin, you really liked Anna and the apocalypse, which, mm -hmm. you know, is kind of a, in a, a strange musical setup. And, and I do believe that, that Phantom of the Paradise does, it's a 70s film, but it represents the period so well in the terms of the, mm. the, the actual kinds of music that it uses. It's, it's, it's a bit of a rock opera. <laughs> that Beachwood happens Can to me all the time. <laughs> Beachwood Canyon, everybody. Fast and the Furious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got Vin Diesel outside. He's, uh, he's ready to come in. Um, he's looking for family, I think. He's <laughs> he lives his life a quarter mile at a time. Um, it might be Michelle Rodriguez. Hey, Michelle. Uh, but but no, I, th I think you'd really enjoy it because it does it does have the quirkiness of something like Anne and the Apocalypse, um, uh, with being still very interesting and so non sequitur. Yeah. The movie just like at all points it just it, and it's 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 Brian De Palma out, outside of you know obviously Carrie being incredible. Like it's you see this and then you're like oh it makes sense why he would do something like Carrie. Like mm. they do live kind of in the same world. Okay, yeah. I'll watch it. I promise. You're welcome, Brian De Palma, but we're plugging this movie. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, speaking of that, were you influenced by anybody in particular? And I kind of want to point out, I noticed uh, the use of color throughout the entire movie, and I didn't know if you were, you had been inspired by anything in particular and what your kind of thought process was behind that, because I really liked the way it looked. Thank you. Thank you. I. Listen, I think that the, the thing about slashers is they tend to have a very specific look to them. And I've already seen, I stopped reading the comments about the trailer, but, but I, I do know that there's been a resurgence of this idea of using 
multicolored horror movies and like oh it's another neon horror movie and like what like to me it, it made sense because it's representative of the culture this is an environment this is a world that it, it thrives off of this undulation of colors it's pinks it's blues it's reds and and playing with contrast uh i i have such an affinity for Tom, thomas alfredson and and like his, you know, let the right one in is such a beautiful film that lives in such a dark space uh, that plays with contrast in such an interesting way. Um, Night of the Hunter is another movie that that the use of, I mean, obviously it's a black and white film, but the use of contrast mm. is is so powerful. And you know, it, it was the marriage of those two things where it's like I want to make a David Fincher adjacent, you know, sodium vapor colored that also lives in this world of, of multicolored carnival vaudevillian fun that makes sense for an EDM movie, but also uses the contrast in a way that is stylized, decidedly stylized. So it doesn't just feel like, um, so it doesn't feel like a 90s horror movie because all of those movies look the same and they're all you know incredible films. But if you were to cut together scenes from Urban Legend, Valentine, Scream, <laughs> You, you would, wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. You wouldn't know the difference because visually yeah. there was a language that was established and it's no different than in the 80s. Yep. There were certain films that broke those molds and that's why we look to Italian cinema when we're talking about horror movies that looked very different because those were movies that did use color. Those were movies that did very obscure, strange cinematic things um, that kind of broke those molds. So I, I was I was hoping to maybe find in in certain places ways to say yeah we're living in this genre we don't have to necessarily we can homage to these genre things but we can also look at it and say you know there's there is hopefully a um, a different visual language we can establish that also makes sense that we're not just doing oh now we're going to cut to a scene of red because i think stylistically it looks cool that the scene is the scene is red it's like no it makes sense because this is a movie of that deals with this kind of lighting. Um, yeah. And so you can kind of hopefully bake that into the narrative and the visual language as well. Right. Definitely. Um, yeah, I would say like out of the ones that you mentioned, I think Valentine, it's funny because like everybody talks about Scream. I think urban legend is kind of coming into its own. Um, Valentine's sort of like in the race and she's running up behind everybody. And she's like, guys, don't forget <laughs> about me. Um, but I actually think Valentine <laughs> visually does a lot of stuff very differently than the others especially once you get to the the, the party scene at the end absolutely and i like i want to live in a room that has like those red plaid walls like so badly in, but... in, in film school i actually in my production design one class my, my professor was larry paul who is you know since passed but uh blade runner back to the future i mean this is a guy who's a production design legend and i actually wrote one of my final papers on production on valentine Oh, really? because, because I don't think people get uh, the, the costuming. Every person who red, is wearing red dies in that scene, but they don't wear red until their death scene. And the, the way that they bake the use of color into that movie and tie it to the actual like narrative is brilliant. And, and like what you were saying, Heather, it, it's so, I think, underappreciated because most people are just looking at it and going, yeah, it's another slasher. And it's, I, I do believe that there was a lot of foresight into actually looking at it and going, you know, we could use color here and we could use red here and, and not just making a, a camp thing about it being about Valentine's Day. Well, right. yeah, you, you, of course we're gonna use red, but how do we tie that to like the costuming? How do we tie that to the walls? And like, I love that. And, and I, you know, using that as a storytelling mechanism is fantastic. I mean, it's the reason that Dylan in his scene in the green room is wearing a black and red shirt against a black and red wall. Like it's, it, it, it does become, the more you can actually, and, and, and use those uh, small visual clues, um, I think is, is really exciting stuff. And to do it in genre fair, where most people, if your movie doesn't look like Midsommar, then you're not like an elevated horror movie. Like, <laughs> I do believe that, that there is, you can bake those things into slashers. You can bake those things yeah. into, into movies where hopefully the, the the visual language is more than just you wanting to, you know, pat yourself on the back and say like, hey, it looks good. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking to that, because I, you know, you've obviously worked with Marvel for a long time and you also have some production design experience too. And 
you mentioned, you know, of course, working with like the costuming and in sort of in synchronicity with, you know, the walls specifically like in the, the dressing room and stuff like that. Like how much does your background working in visual, like the visualization of films, like prepare you for doing something like this? Because you mentioned it is sort of like a heightened world where everything has these pops of color, uh, but you're also sort of playing, you know, as you mentioned, the contrast, like were you, how confident were you going into it? Like, oh, we're going to nail this and we're going to get this, like be able to sort of, you know, as you mentioned, like with Valentine, bake those layers in so that way when people are watching it, there's a little more to pull apart. Absolutely. I, I think it's, it's tough because I could sit here and say like, yeah, we knew it all. But like there's, there's, there's so much you can do prior. And, and uh, I always gravitated toward, you know, when I was in film school, I chose to use production design as my, um, you, you had to pick uh, a directive when you became a junior, like if you were you know, directing, editing, like the five uh, kind of key crew positions, director of photography, uh, sound or, or production design. And when I was there, there were 65 directors in my class. Oh, wow. and, and I just looked at it and everybody was just like, well, it's your calling card. Your thesis film is your calling card. It's gonna be, you know, if you don't do it right, if you don't direct a thesis film, like you're not gonna get hired and you're not gonna direct. And, and I just was like, I was kind of fascinated by, by, you know, someone like Catherine Hardwick. She came up from production design, Joe Johnston, art director, George Lucas, art director, these, these people who came up from the art background. And I looked at it and I was like, well, I could choose production design. I'm still gonna be on set. And the first thing you learn in film school is visual storytelling. Like <laughs> The whole point of, of it is to learn to try to tell stories in a visual way without dialogue. Um, and I love good dialogue. Like I'm, obviously you've seen the movie, like well, people talk a lot, but like, I do believe that knowing how to tell the story with the costumes, with the backgrounds, with color. Um, there's a great book called If It's Purple, Someone's Gonna Die. And it's mm -hmm. about color evolution throughout history. Um, and they focus on, you know, The Wizard of Oz and Chicago and all these, like how they actually used color as foreshadowing elements. Mm -hmm. And it was just things like that where, where I was like, I can choose this path and maybe I'm not gonna make a thesis film, but I'm gonna production design seven movies and I'm going to learn all these different trades of, of how to set, you know, set dressing and, and work with a costume designer. The amount of directors I worked with in film school who said, I don't speak production design is unfathomable. And then you look at people like Robert Eggers, you look at people like Catherine Hardwick, and you look at the, you know, these people who have turned from, like, I don't know outside of maybe being a DP, any other, other crew position that becomes a director outside of a PD. Be, because you just you have to learn to tell the story without anybody saying anything and you have to be excited about motifs you have to be excited about symbolism you have to go in and be like it's more than just what's on the page guys like and and when you're doing a low budget indie movie especially you you really don't have the opportunity to build sets you don't really have the opportunity to do uh a lot of you know uh, changes to the environments you're shooting in so you have to find places that really convey this story in ways that you can either dress or, or use as their naked form um, to tell the story. So I do believe that it does factor in um, and, and hopefully, you know, come across a little more inspired uh, than if I was just someone who didn't understand that language and was just like, yeah, put them in whatever, like they're millennial kids, put them in some jeans and a t-shirt, you know, like really, really trying to, to understand um, both visually and thematically what could make sense and be exciting. I, I think, you know, if, if we can encourage people to want to go back and watch the movie and look for something that they maybe missed before, there, there is something to be said about that, um, hopefully. What I thought was interesting too, Jacob, was that um, you had LGBTQ, whatever, I just screwed it up, LGBTQ, representation without it being a plot point, which is nice because we're all kind of sick of being a plot point. But tell, talk about that a little bit. I, I think that representation in, in especially genre film is so important. Um, but I do believe that we lean into, I mean, uh, most recently something like Freaky did it well, where it was like, here, let's have a, a queer character who's not going through being like, what does it mean to be gay? It's like, that, that's just who he is. Yeah. And I think that the more we can 
normalize representation and not make their arc predicated on their sexuality is, yep. is really promising because we've seen so many times before where it's like, well, it's a struggle. And it's it, it, to an audience member who is not in the community, it gets tired. It gets tired to be like, well, let me present another angle of, of trying to be okay with your sexuality versus it being like, here's a person who loves men and that's just who he is, but he's also all these other things. Or here's right. you know a female character who has had girlfriends and boyfriends, but that's just who she is and that's okay. And we don't make a meal out of the fact that she has probably struggled at some point. And I think with someone, um, I, I, I don't I don't think it's really, I mean, it is, I, I, it's not really, but like the character in the film who does end up being, you know, in the community, I did want to make it a point where it's like in the, in the genre, especially the, the setup is usually the same. It's usually two couples and then like the odd man out. And I didn't want to just have it be that. <laughs> I, I wanted this idea that you could have a strong, interesting, deep female character who has a male friend who was there for her during hard times. And it's, and when you get the reveal about him, it suddenly makes sense where it's like, oh, he is a little cynical. He is a little bit of a, of a guy who is struggling with his sexuality, but that's not, you know, the whole movie, you don't make a meal out of that. You don't right. make, you, you don't make it about his only defining characteristic is his sexuality. And I hope that that becomes more of a norm in cinema where it's like these characters are not just their sexuality. And it's the same way I feel as a filmmaker where it's like, you can be part of a community and that not be the only defining characteristic about the stories you tell. Right. Um, be, because that, I don't know, I feel like it becomes a slippery slope. And I, I, I do believe that, um, you know, LGBTQ characters in films where they're not caricatures, where they're not just like, yeah, now I'm gonna be the butt of the joke. <laughs> I hope that's the direction. You know, I, I hope that we're moving to yeah. a place of, no, of normalizing um, those things without it becoming like, like I said, a caricature of, of being gay or bi or, or trans or, or lesbian. Like, I, I just really think that you can make a character who is so much more than just who they love. Yep. They're, they're that and they're all these other things. Right. Um, and, and the more we can, we can explore that I think is really interesting. Nice. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned, you know, Dreamcatcher 5. So um, if we back it up a little bit, <laughs> Have you thought about like if you got to come back and do a sequel for this, like where you would want to take this and how far you'd want to take it? Like, I mean, does it culminate at EDC? Do you get like four hundred thousand people <laughs> around you? He's I mean, like, I know. <laughs> you know, we we can try to get Pasquale on the phone or something and see if like we can work it out. I'm ready. No, uh, <laughs> there there is <clears throat> there may or may not be a draft already of the sequel. Um, I think so much too about this genre is like you you kind of have to have a foresight of franchise like hopefully like obviously it's a perfect world situation you could have a movie that comes and goes and people are like eh, what was that like that movie that I, that I hated um or you know if things go right and and you do get a sequel I do think it's important to always write and it, that's I guess the marvel side of me you always want to create an environment where you can build the the world out if you write yourself into a corner where there is no, you know, there is no sequel without it being a prequel, or there is no sequel without it reinventing the story you've already told, then I think that that could be a problem. So if you think about it in a way where it's like, you know, obviously the movie ends where it ends, and it's kind of like you realize that the movie is the prologue, and then you can be like, now we've got a whole, you know, chapter book full of places we could go with the story, um, and and. And it's all predicated by character, right? So, like, if you can if you can create characters that f feel hopefully that the people want to continue watching their story evolve or change or or whatever the case may be, um, you know, always keeping an eye toward that, I, I do think is kind of exciting, especially in the genre space. Right. Yeah, it's exciting. I mean, you and you have a draft already. I can tell. I mean, maybe there might be a draft. There might be a draft, <laughs> and. You know, it may or, or may not be. And like the thing about, you know, look, look at something like Scream is a great, it's like second movie you can do more, 
the second you know like you can you can bigger things are yeah. just like you know there's there is a if you get permission to go to the next step then i think you can really go now we're going here ah oh, now we're going to do this right. and 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 i think that that's really exciting stuff um potentially if people yeah. you know if, if the first movie does well yeah that's, that's, that's super exciting that's I, I am very proud to know you jacob um <laughs> but uh yeah no that was re that's really interesting now it comes out the fifth correct march 5th mm -hmm. okay yes uh, yeah yeah a week two weeks one week three weeks <laughs> two weeks <laughs> what is time anymore really <laughs> you know it's, What's it's today i is don't know <laughs> it's a tough one it's it feels like it's so hard like it's it's great to do these kind of conversations because it really is invigorating in terms of the, uh, we premiered at Berlin in 2019, no, Ooh. 2020, not <laughs> and, and it was before the pandemic. And so, you know, when, when we did that, it was like, you know, EFM and Berlin and we were so excited, like, yeah, it's sale, big, great. And then it was like COVID and there was nothing, you know, for, for months where it was like companies figuring out how to either pay their employees or buy content and and the movie just kind of sat and um you know it took probably a good five or six months before we started selling international before we started selling you know obviously with samuel goldwyn and um it, it was you know you, you you deflate a bit and it you know it, it's no secret plenty of movies i'm sure you've talked to plenty of people who've made a movie cabin in the woods was made in 2019 or 2009 it didn't come out until like 2012 you know it, right. it, it can take time sometimes and then that becomes um it could be taxing in a lot of ways but it does reinvigorate to talk to people who have finally been able to start to see the movie um and and it it re-energizes you to being like yeah we did something really you know cool and and it took a long time and and that journey just makes you a stronger person um because everything in hollywood takes time no matter what you're doing you know Absolutely. so so learning to appreciate the journey and not find it resentful, um, I do believe is, is super important. So you don't become just indoctrinated with just like exhaustion of hoping, you know, <laughs> that, that, that it happens and sees the light of day. And, and so I'm, I'm just super, you know, grateful to, to be in this place, um, to be able to share the movie. And I don't know. You know, I think this genre is super divisive. I think there's going to be people who, who really get it and some people who don't. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I've like removed myself enough to be ready for, for that kind of feedback where it's like, hopefully, you know, I, I know there's going to be people that think it don't, it's not scary enough. It's not violent enough. It's not this enough. And, and hopefully adversely people might be surprised by the fact that it's not those things, you know, that it's, it, you know, that it is more Greek tragedy than, than hack and slash um, nightmare fuel. Now is it, and then, because I can't remember, is this VOD, is it going to drive-ins also? It is, but I don't know, I don't know which places are getting drive-ins. I think it'll be the big, you know, the Texas and the California and the New York, and I'm sure Florida will do it since everything there is open. Um, <laughs> but <Pretty much>. <laughs> their <laughs> movie theaters are open. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you just, <laughs> just throw it up at the movie theater. Um, but but I I believe that the big places will get it in drive-ins and then um yeah yeah but I don't know where okay perfect so no, that's that's still exciting that's awesome you should go make sure you go to a drive-in and see it with a crowd I with guess. A cr <laughs> with a, yeah I well, next to you <laughs> or yeah hey do you guys like, I think it's it, it definitely I think if you can see it with people there's something there is a camaraderie about the movie I I hope where it's like if, if we do it right, <laughs> and if people that, that it does start conversations because there is a huge social commentary like woven throughout. So if we can breed some sort of conversation that is not just predicated on how nonviolent it is, that that maybe there is you know, <laughs> something to be said. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, good. Well, I I'm so happy that you, you we got a chance to talk to you. I was very excited to see. Uh, the PR release, and I'm like, we can talk to Jacob. Yeah, no, this is this is so great. I, I follow both of you guys' work, so it is, you know, really, there's something so exciting and and I don't know, fulfilling to be able to sit down and talk to you guys about about the movie because um, I respect oh. you both and your your opinions so much. 
That was really know, nice. I don't think anybody's ever said that like they're excited to talk to me. I, I'm not used <laughs> to that. I'm going to live off this all week now. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling great now. Please do. Yeah. Yes. Please, please just live on, live, thrive from it. <laughs> I will. I'm, I'm, I'm set now. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again, Jacob. I really appreciate you being here. I'm excited for everybody to see your movie. Um, again, March 5th, um, VOD and drive-ins, kind of wherever you stream your movies. Yeah. Uh, look for it. And um, we'll wait to see Dreamcatcher 2. <laughs> That was me knocking on, him? yeah, because oh, I'm, I'm knocking on wood. I'm knocking on wood. <laughs> you're like, Shh, don't say it, Kevin. Don't say it. <laughs> no, will it into existence? Will yeah. it into existence? I'll knock on wood too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. I appreciate it. We appreciate absolutely. it. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, for all so our watchers much. out there, thank you for joining us, and we will uh, see you next week.